Now that we have established the biological function of sex as a way for organisms to have an edge and give their offspring a better chance of survival, can please somebody explain to me how am I supposed to leave anybody pregnant when all I want is to be each and every hole of my body. Well, babes, it turns out there's a huge difference between why we have the parts that we have and why we like to use them the way we do. designer knows that people in one way or another will never use whatever it is that you're designing be that a product or anything it doesn't matter but people are not gonna fully use it the way that you intended them to use it. because we're humans I mean q-tips for example they were not designed and they were not conceived with the intention of being insert it into your ear canal, but people do it anyway. I do it because it feels good. Well, sex and sexuality work pretty much the same way. What I mean is evolution doesn't have a designer or anything of the sort behind it, but we don't use our body parts necessarily for the reason they evolved. And I don't mean only our sexual parts. Ears, for example, ears evolved to help us with listening, not to be decorated with jewelry, but we do it anyway, because it feels good. So I guess it shouldn't surprise anybody to know that humans like to play with our sexual parts pretty much in any context, be that with the intention of reproducing or not. We are social animals, and having sex is a social activity. Even masturbation can be a social interactive activity. And we have observed both masturbation and sex for just enjoyment of sex and without any intention of reproduction, also in animals. What that suggests is that mm, the enjoyment of sex must have evolved for a biological reason, for a natural cause. But when? How? And more importantly, why? Well, once more, it might be helpful to see exactly what goes on elsewhere in the animal kingdom to give us a better idea of what is biologically required to want and to enjoy sex. In the more basal animals, which are often isogamic, like protozoans, for example, they don't need any sort of elaborate search to find an, a sexual partner. Anybody that is sexual compatible with you is good enough to reproduce with. So. There's basically no fuss, no drama. <laughs> no bra. No, no, any space here. The total opposite of my life. Things get more complicated when sexes differentiate, as is the case in more complex animals. Having separate sexual roles means that individuals must actively look for another individual to sexually interact with. And this individual must be not only from the other sexual role, which is opposite to yours, but also they must be mature, they must be compatible, and they must be desirable. Basal anisogamic species, like corals, solve this by dumping a massive amount of gametes into their environments, hoping that, in their large numbers, probability will ensure that at least one will find another and reproduction will come through. This means, however, that most of the sexual gametes are wasted, either washed away or consumed by other species. Some more complex species have yet another solution to this problem. Instead of dumping their precious female gametes into the environment and hoping that maybe a random passing male gamete will fertilize them, they choose to recreate the same scenario, but without giving up the control of where that fertilization will occur because they keep the gametes within themselves. In other words, some insects reproduce by orgy. But 
the scenario that is more familiar to us is, of course, the one that we observe in the vast majority of mammals, which is males chasing females. And that is because, as we saw it on the last video, in mammals, females are the ones who take up most of the investment of resources, time and everything to produce a new individual of the species. So it's only natural that females will try to be a little bit selective about, about which male they allow them to fertilize them. Is it obvious why courtship evolved in mammals now? Including us, of course. We said before that human eggs are basically biological gold. It takes so much from the female to produce one single egg and a lot more to grow that into a baby. They're naturally picking. But... Remember that we just said a few minutes ago that regardless of their chromosomes, humans like to have sex, plenty of sex, without any intention of producing a baby. That means that courtship, the act of trying to lure someone into the act <laughs> with you, must work also in any kind of case where sex is only intended for fun and not for children. Or, said in a more formal way, somewhere in our evolutionary path, we must have developed the capacity to enjoy sex. And we ended up with the reality of sex being both a biological function for reproduction and a social experience to be shared with others and that usually brings pleasure to those participating in it. Thus, we crave it. Just like we crave food. We eat food because we need it to be alive. But we also eat food because it feels good. So we have naturally developed a lot of codes and rituals and culture around the act of eating. Some people like foods that we find not appealing at all, or even disgusting. But this is usually a social consequence of what codes and tastes are more popular, whatever you are. It all depends on what we were taught was delicious or good. We must always remember that something that seems exotic or bizarre to you could very well be ordinary and part of the routine to somebody else. And sex works just the same. Just like the enjoyment of food depends on a myriad of psychological variables that will make each individual feeling experience mostly unique, sex depends also in a large, large part on our psychology and being in the right situation with the right person. Sexual arousal is not accessory to the enjoyment of sex. The more excited and the more aroused an individual is, the more they will have, you know, the desire to have sex. And the more the desire will, will be there, the more they will enjoy it once they get it. Not only that, but sexual arousal must be a social response because it can resonate and get stronger as we perceive others or our partners get more aroused with us. In short, is the positive feedback of excitation and arousal between the participants of a sexual act what will bring the climax, not simply coming? One simple way to discern and to observe this is to observe one's own response to masturbation. When we masturbate and we get really aroused, the resulting orgasm can be pretty insane and, and as intense as the ones that you can get having sex with somebody else. But when we're really not that excited, when we're not really that aroused, the result could be disappointed uh, or we might not be even able to have a result. What that means is that sexual intercourse is not inherently better than masturbation, sexually speaking. But the presence of that positive feedback of excitation and arousal means that it can, sexual intercourse can 
be more intense, way more intense and fulfilling than masturbation for the participants in the act, if they are surfing the same way. What I mean is that many times, one of the reasons, 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 what I mean to say is that many times, one of the reasons why we like to dress good, smell good, have a positive, you know, outcome to life and positive view and having people like you is because you want to be and you want to feel sexually appealing to somebody else. Not someone in a specific, not necessarily has to be a particular person. It could be just simply the, the fact of feeling desired, which feels good. Not to everybody else necessarily. I mean, many among us don't give a flying F if the whole world wants you or not, wants a piece of you or not. But we do usually want at least somebody, at least one person to find us sexy. But of course, this is the generalized scenario because there are people who have none or or very, very little sexual response. They feel very little in terms of sexual arousal. For some people, intimacy and physical touch is exciting enough. So they basically have no desire for sex, like penetration, mutual stimulation, just maybe a kiss that's fulfilling enough, that's intimate enough for them. That doesn't mean that they are unable to come. They have absolutely everything required to do so. In fact, since human sex is basically a rubbing game, if you rub them in the right spot, the right way, they will come. What will not come with that is that part of enjoyment that we usually associate with the fact of having a happy ending. For them, it's just going to be, huh? This is the way that I want you to start thinking about asexuality a little bit. In asexuals, the place of sex as a dual function, reproduction and social enjoyment exists as well, but the latter is very, very weak or even not present, sometimes not desired at all. That place is taken by other social activities that brings them social and or bodily pleasure because I mean, sex doesn't do it for them. As much as they can find someone extremely attractive and sexy and, and, and have feelings, develop feelings for them and, and, and want them, sex is just not there. So this hints to the fact that the social component of sex has nothing to do with our biology. We don't have sex outside of the explicit cases where a couple is trying to, to procreate, but we don't have sex to satisfy any sort of biological drive. If, if that was the case, we will all stay all alone, masturbating in peace, and only looking for a partner when we feel the need to procreate. And this is why it is so important to always keep in mind that sex is a biological function, but sexuality is a completely and 100% social phenomenon. We'll go deeper next time because it feels Thank you very much for making it all the way up to here. Um, I really appreciate it. This is a baby channel. So each and every single like and subscription is just as valuable as a human egg. <laughs> Basically gold. So if you leave one, I very much appreciate it. And if you don't, I still hope to see you next time.